is my pre-research talk. My research is set to start in uh, July of this year. And my project is entitled Reinventing the Tracheostomy. My name is Liz, I'm a PGY2, and I graduated from <coughs> Stanford um, Medical School, but also Stanford Business School in 2011. And along with my business school degree, um, I did a lot of work uh, at the design school, which I'll talk a little bit about. I don't have any disclosures. So I'd like to start this discussion by talking about what inspires us. I know that we were all inspired to go into medicine for some reason, whether that's uh, curing disease with our technical skills, or interfacing with technology, or trying our hand in the lab. I think sometimes as a resident, it's really hard to remember what inspired you to go into medicine because you're so busy trying to learn the profession, and also uh, just trying to get through the day and provide care for your patients. Um, but today, I'd like to talk about the uh, inspired devices uh, that we use in humans uh, to cure disease or to uh, help with their diseases. So this is my first example. Um, this is a prosthetic leg. Uh, it's a perfectly functional leg. It's approximately skin color. It's approximately the right shape. It has all of the accoutrements that go on a leg, a black sock, an Oxford shoe. This prosthetic leg makes perfect logical sense. It works. It looks pretty close to a leg. But what about this? Um, these legs look nothing like human legs. They look like metallic springboards. They're called cheetah legs because they were designed after the cheetah. They look mechanical, but they look powerful. The person wearing these legs' name is Amy Mullins. Uh, Amy is a woman who was born with a congenital uh, absence or her fibulas bilaterally. Um, and she has since become a spokesperson for uh, readjusting how we think about people with disability. And this is a quote that I love from one of her TED Talks. There's an important difference in distinction between the objective medical fact of my being an amputee and the subjective societal opinion of whether or not I'm disabled. In fact, uh, Amy often refers to herself as super able. She <coughs> recounts uh, an instance where she walked into a bar and actually had chosen prosthetic legs that gave her an extra four inches, and her <laughs> friend came up to her and said, but that's not fair. Um, so, uh, this is kind of the crux of the question I'd like to explore. Does a medical deficiency requiring an external device pre-label as someone who's being disabled, or does it have to do that? So I'd like to start by looking into our own field um, at a device that's actually been uh, become quite evolved, and that is the hearing aid. So uh, the early, some of the earliest described uh, hearing devices were the cupping of the hand, which I'm sure happened much before 130 AD. Kind of a spin-off of this uh, in the 1800s were ear trumpets and conversation tubes. Um, and what these really did was give you about a 10 to 15 decibel gain, um, mostly a sound gathering component, a lot for uh, sound attenuation between the speakers and the listeners, but obviously without a mechanical component, didn't do much uh, for the listener. Knowledge of bone conduction also dates back to the 1500s. Actually, reading about these devices, there were some really interesting descriptions. Some of the earliest <coughs> bone uh, conduction devices were uh, just a tube put between um, the speakers and the listener's teeth. Uh, that was not a very popular device. Um, this is uh, actually a bone conducting fan that is, is then uh, has a trumpet-like bottom to it. And again, you can understand the concept of bone conduction. Something that I thought was really fascinated as I went through uh, my research was the use of disguised aids. Um, and along on this side, I guess I should have put these blinds down, but there were a lot of really fascinating quotes that kind of uh, speak to Amy Mullins' point. Here's a quote by a uh, physician, oh, it should be 1891. Uh, Most hearing aids are of such size and shape that they clearly draw attention to the imperfection of the wearer. This is enough to make people shrink back from wearing such an aid, and I think that's true today. Um, this is an ear trumpet kind of built into a headband. Here you have one built into a fan so you can hide behind the fan. Uh, this one on the end was actually one of my favorites. Uh, it was used by um, a king from Brazil in the 1800s where the uh, speaker had to kneel before him and speak into these <laughs> hollow, uh, <laughs> hollow receptacles and then he would you know, disguise the, the trumpet in his ear. Um, a few other favorites, a hearing device disguised as a water canteen, one that uh, fit 
not so inconspicuously <laughs> under your beard, <laughs> and a golden uh, condo so you can that look stylish. <laughs> so, um, you know, the hearing, the hearing aid timeline, there's really been a national partnership uh, with technology, and I think that's one of the reasons that it's allowed uh, this device to evolve um, so profoundly. So here in 1876, we see Alexander Graham Bell, his invention of the telephone. Um, he actually had a mother and a wife that were both deaf, and so he was very interested in hearing and kind of paved the way for some early hearing devices. Um, other uh, advancements, such as the vacuum tube, the transistor, and the microprocessor also went hand in hand uh, with hearing devices. And you can see, um, you know, as recently as the 1980s, Hearing devices were huge. This one was mostly used for research, but of course, more recently, um, we've gone on to develop things like the cochlear implant and this uh, behind-the-ear hearing aid, which uh, you know is barely visible. Um, so, uh, from hearing trumpet to cochlear implant, we've really come a long way in the in the realm of hearing devices. And not only that, um, we've kind of been supplemented by what society is doing. Uh, here you see David Beckham wearing hearing uh, Bluetooth, and you know it's it's even more visible than a lot of hearing aids we see see today. Um, but these devices, as I mentioned before, have had a lot of help too. You know, prosthetic limbs have big, been a big a big interest to the army. Um, obviously, for athletes, uh, it's something that's evolved, and hearing aids in the same way that a lot evolved alongside uh, computer technology. So my conclusion from looking at these devices is that technology is sexy. People want to iterate, iterate on devices um, that have a techn technological component. And my conclusion number two is that humans don't want to be defined by their deficiencies. But what about the Dowdy devices? So I think we can all agree that the urinary catheter is not a very sexy device. Um, but I'd like to tell you a little bit about a friend of mine from the design school and the story of the compact catheter. So uh, this group um, from the design school was tasked with working with children who had chronic illnesses. Um, and they were just kind of given the broad task of these kids didn't used to live past the age of 15. Now they're living into young adolescence and 30s. But you know their lives aren't entirely normal. Why don't you meet with them and kind of think about what they're going through and see if there's any way that you can improve their lives. So when they started working on this project, they started working with some uh, young guys, 20-year-old uh, college freshmen, um, who had neurological disorders requiring them to self-cath every day. And what they found was that a lot of these guys would you know, have to carry around eight or 10 of these you know, red Ravenel catheters in their backpacks around school. And a lot of them were resorting to practices that weren't entirely safe, like curling them up, putting them in an aspirin bottle. They were kind of uh, using workarounds so that they wouldn't be embarrassed by their friends. What they found was that the urinary catheter actually hadn't been iterated on since 1947. They came up with this device um, that they recently presented at the Aspen Ideas Festival. It's called the Compact Catheter, and it's really simple. It's just a uh, kind of new way of packaging the catheter that's sterile and also small, about the size of a condom wrapper, so these young guys can slip it into their wallets. And what they found that was interesting was that they designed for a very specific person. They designed for these young adolescent boys, but what they're also finding is that a lot of men with prostate issues that have to self-cath and are 60 are also still going out to dinner and also don't want to carry around these huge package catheters. So, uh, and looking at the tracheostomy, um, which is my uh, proposed project, um, a, a brief uh, history here. And the history on trachs is actually much harder to uh, come across than the history on hearing uh, devices. Um, but in 1546, Antonio uh, Brassavolo, an Italian um, MD, was one of the first uh, known successful tracheotomies. I didn't know this, but George Washington in 1799 actually died of an airway obstruction, thought to potentially be epiglottitis. And while his physician knew about um, tracheostomy, he didn't perform it because uh, he was too scared of uh, harming the president. Um, but here are some examples of uh, you know, tracheostomies are on the market. We have the Jackson, which is um, metal. It's nice because it's flush. It's used more for uh, permanent trachs. The Shiley, which we all know and use uh, very frequently. And something called the Moore tube, which is, again, um, flexible and lies flush with the skin. But as you can see, all of these devices look uh, quite medical. 
In addition to that, I think as we all know, trait uh, wear is extremely stigmatized in our um, society. When I went and talked to Dr. Jackler about uh, this presentation, he actually um, brought my attention to a lot of the cigarette uh, carton ads which show tracheostomy, you know, in conjunction with smoking, in conjunction with death, really a warning that, you know, this is what will happen to you if you don't quit smoking. And here we see, you know, an otherwise healthy looking kid, um, but with this kind of high profile plastic uh, device sticking out of his neck, you can imagine how he might be stigmatized when he's starting his first day of school. So a little bit of data about uh, tracheostomies. This comes from um, a paper in the UK uh, published in actually 2012, the, the data was from 2009, but they found that in 2009 in the UK, I couldn't find the corollary uh, US data, um, 5,400 tracheostomies were performed and 3,300 of those uh, were for a permanent or uh, temporary tracheostomy. And also notable, there was a pretty high uh, rate of morbidity, uh, of mortality associated uh, with, with um, the, the post-op period, mostly due to um, the underlying disease. Uh, this uh, is a paper um, that was actually published in 2003 from here in the States, and it was just a national review of pediat pediatric tracheostomies and estimates that for, uh, about 5,000 tracheostomies were performed per year in 2003. Now, um, two interesting things that I found in this paper, there's kind of a bimodal distribution. Most tracheostomies are uh, used in children either uh, at or under the age of one or in the adolescent period. Also notable um, was uh, the underlying diagnosis requiring the tracheostomy. Um, for the young infants, as you can imagine, it was mostly congenital anomalies and prematurity. And in the uh, adolescent patients, uh, usually had to do with um, accidents. But notably, tracheostomies used to be used much more for upper airway uh, infections. With the advent of vaccines, that's gone down substantially. So now most of the tricks that we're doing really do require at least some kind of um, long-term temporary use of the trach or even uh, permanent trach. So I'd like to switch gears right now and tell you a little bit about the design school, um, which is just across the street. Um, this is kind of their uh, aims, just uh, written out on a napkin, which is to uh, create future innovators, um, to use multidisciplinary teams to promote design thinking, uh, to really foster radical collabor collaboration across disciplines, and to really tackle big real life projects. Um, and I'd like to just take a moment and show you a little video that comes from the D School that I, like I said, I've done a lot of uh, learning over there, but I think it just kind of helps put you in the mindset of what it's all about. Oh. Joe, can I get sound? Maybe not. Sorry. We can also sound man. This is when's the time.
this me time, max out your creativity. Um, but you also need to stay focused on the problem that you're in. Have that moment where um, you're on a project and you come up with much better, more creative ideas than you thought were possible. Being in the design school space and kind of being around boundless creativity and uh, everyone's an entrepreneur kind of mentality made me think that maybe I would do something more entrepreneurial to have that kind of confidence to go back to the day. Maybe this is like PhD student thing, like we think a lot and then like have a lot of different ideas, but never really like try them out. I think the biggest thing that I learned was that we really need to buy into those actually creative. There are a lot of things that I don't know inspired me about being at the business school and uh, in particular with this video. That bias towards action is something um, that you really see over there, and I think the reason that you see it over there is kind of their methodology. So this is the rubric that they use. Um, empathize, define, ideate, prototype, and test. And essentially what this means, the first stage of any uh, design thinking project is to really empathize with your user. So in this case that would mean um, going to meet with uh, both children and adults who are using traits, find out what their uh, issues are with the traits, whether it's um, a safety issue from the parents, maybe it's a training issue, uh, maybe it's an aesthetic issue. Really uh, do a deep dive into kind of how it is in a day of the life of a, of, of a for example, a child wearing a trait to school every day. Um, the next step is kind of defining uh, the project, exactly what is that spe specific need that you're designing for. Um, ID and prototyping are essentially just going through a bunch of ideas, bringing those ideas back to the user, getting feedback, and then finally um, testing your ideas in a more structured way. So. My own experience um, at the design school, after working there, I have um, two patents on two different devices. I'm going to tell you briefly about uh, one of my experiences, and that is with Adaptair. Uh, this was a team um, that I worked with, and uh, it, was a, it was a project having to do with um, children in Bangladesh with pneumonia. This is something I didn't know before starting the project, but every year, two million children die from pneumonia. Um, it's more than AIDS, malaria, and measles combined, so this was really a big problem. Um, we were working with a hospital in Bangladesh called ICDDRB, uh, which had designed a device called the Bubble CPAP, which is essentially a super low cost um, CPAP device to uh, provide positive pressure for uh, children with pneumonia. And what we kind of identified when we started working with them was that there were three major components, a source, an interface, and a back pressure device. But again, a big part of this design thinking is narrowing your focus. So after spending a lot of time empathizing with our users, traveling to Bangladesh, we came up with this uh, user point of view or need statement, and that was that resource-strapped intensive care providers needed a way to maintain a closed system of life-sustaining oxygen delivery for pediatric patients with respiratory distress. And when I say a closed system, what I mean is that the nasal <coughs> cannula, the nasal interface that they were using, all of the positive pressure they were creating was actually leaking out because they didn't have customized nasal interfaces like we uh, do here at Stanford. So we worked with our designer to essentially um, design a flared interface that both interfaced with uh, the nasal cannulas already in use in Bangladesh, but had a, a tip to it to allow it to accommodate many different sized noses. So it was a really simple solution. It was a super low cost solution. And it was um, a solution that fit uh, very well into our market gap analysis, finding that in Bangladesh and in developing countries in general, there was kind of a one-size-fits-none solution. Here at Stanford, there was a many-size-fits-many -many solution, um, but it just wasn't uh, cost-feasible for other areas. Um, so uh, this is a project that took us about six months. It's currently undergoing trials in uh, the hospitals in Bangladesh. Um, we've received several uh, design awards, and we've also been uh, featured on TED and Fast Company kind of uh, design um, blogs and news feeds. So two uh, big things that I'd like to kind of uh, look at when I move forward on this project are function versus art. I think as physicians, we often think of things uh, purely based on their functionality. Does this work? Yes, the urinary catheter works, but does that mean it's something that's nice for patients to use? Um, I would beg to differ that still there are many things that we use that still can be iterated on. Um, and two, design for within the hospital versus designing for the living world. So this project really born out of a conversation that I had with Dr. Poltai when I was on the pediatric service, 
He was just talking about how so many of the parents um, were, and part of their algorithm deciding whether or not they wanted to place a trait in their child was the fact that they were going to have to start school, interact with the rest of the world, and that they would be stigmatized, and that would get them off to a really uh, poor start in the rest of their lives. So potential directions, um, I kind of alluded to aesthetic reinvention of the trait, kind of some trait safety issues. I think something that comes to mind is the fact that from a materials perspective, um, pediatric traits don't have an inner cannula. Uh, I think there's also a lot that could be potentially done with, say, uh, the 3D printer, which we have several 3D printers here at Stanford, and actually in my last design project, used one of those for maybe highly customizable traits. Um, but something to keep in mind with these projects is even though I have an idea, really the main um, starting point for any of these design projects are really building empathy with the user. And I think historically as physicians, um, we oftentimes think, oh, here's what would make uh, this person's life better. But it's not until you actually go in and build <coughs> empathy with the patient, with the users, you can kind of start to better define what it is uh, that they need improvement on. So here's kind of a rough timeline. Uh, in July and August, I plan to uh, start meeting with uh, anyone who interfaces with a tracheostomy patient, the patients themselves, the parents, the respiratory therapists here, our nurse practitioners that do the education uh, for trach patients, um, as well as the physicians um, that use them. Um, in September, I'd like to really define my project. You know, you usually start with a ton of different point of view projects. Who am I designing for? Am I designing for the physicians? Am I designing for the patients? Am I designing for the parents? Um, and then, uh, September through November will really be ideating and prototyping, and that is a very uh, dynamic process. Uh, I'll be going back and forth with my designer. We'll probably be taking our prototypes again back out to out to the patients that we uh, empathize with initially, um, and seeing what works, what doesn't, and how they want to reiterate on our projects. And then finally, um, you know, testing the project. And something with the trach, it's it's kind of hard to. Know, expect to go through something like clinical trials this early, but there are definitely other ways of testing, like um, the CAPE uh, facility across the street, which we used in our prior project. Um, these are my collaborators. Uh, David Janka is a design school fellow that also worked with Joanne on her project. Um, Ale is uh, an entrepreneur and designer who I worked with on the previous project and is very excited um, to again uh, try another medical device. Uh, Paul Yock and Goran Saul, who are both um, from the biodesign uh, program, Anna Mesner um, and the pediatric side uh, will be my kind of pediatric mentor, John Sun Wu for my adult mentor, and then Dr. Damrose and Dr. Sun are also going to help me um, kind of share my project with some of the patients they're working with. In addition to that, I also live next door to um, one of the members of the D School, and he's been kind of helping me along. Um, these are my references, and I uh, Love to talk more about the project. My uh, project is entitled The Standardized Bedside Surgical Airway Dr. Daniels and Son. Uh, I have no relevant disclosures to make. Uh, I'm going to start by presenting a case that we did as an M&M &M a little bit earlier in the year that kind of spurred this project. I'll give a little background on the project to talk about how I am currently implementing it and how it will continue to be implemented, how it will be evaluated and then discussed in future directions. So the case uh, is a patient that a lot of us remember very well. He's a 53-year-old gentleman with a T3M1 M0 swing of the hypotherance. He went to the OR um, uh, in actually, yeah, an, uh, um, uh, October of 2013 for a total wire injection with bilateral mass and then general free clock. Uh, at the conclusion of the case, which ended very late at night, the endotracheal tube was left in place and the tracheal uh, injection stoma sutured to the chest, and he subsequently coughed it out in the ICU, uh, which spurred a number of <coughs> very uh, excited events, uh, and excited pages and phone calls, uh, among which the on call uh, resident noted that there was a lot of confusion in the ICU and plastics uh, team's understanding of the airway, specifically of uh, ventilation and even intubation through the as part of the analysis of the QI, which uh, took place in early January, uh, excuse me, late January, uh, one of the points that was brought up as uh, being worth further investigation was the discussion of how to improve communication with other teams, for instance, buses and uh, the ICU, uh, not to mention nursing staff. Um, so, anytime you recognize a need or you think of a 
cool idea. Chances are someone else has thought of it first. And uh, in this case, it was uh, Dr. Kevin Quo, who uh, came up with, or from his own experience um, at UCSF, came up with the idea of a standardized airway form to be posted at the bedside. When you Google uh, Kevin Quo images, you get this. Huh. You find out that he was a uh, valedictorian in his class at USC. Um, and you also find these images. <coughs> not exactly sure why. And yeah. <laughs> okay. maybe he can tell us. So, uh, <laughs> In terms of uh, the work that's been done before, in 2010, a group from UCSF published this article uh, about uh, essentially a standardized uh, bedside airway form. Um, and in their project, they implemented a, uh, a form that differentiated any differentiation between tracheostomy and myrectomy. Um, it's placed at the bedside, had pertinent other information. And uh, they did an analysis where they distributed six mm -hmm. question surveys bef uh, before implementing the form, 20, 24 months after. Um, these were distributed to uh, nursing, RT, ICU, uh, medicine residents, surgery residents, um, and then uh, they surveyed again, again, two years afterwards. Uh, no significant differences were found um, in uh, performance on the surveys, although certain key areas improved, like understanding of where infecting the anatomy. Um, however, the form, uh, those who participated in emergency situations with patients who had the form at the bedside uh, gave very positive review and said it was extremely useful. Um, and this was published in the uh, International Journal of Laryngology and Procedures. Um, so in terms of my implementation, uh, the process that I've already been through first was a discussion with uh, the resident team, as well as Dr. Stamros and Sung, to come up with uh, specific things that were, uh, we thought would be good to address in our own context with this type of project. Um, my second move was a review of the literature, um, and that included a recent consensus statement um, by the Academy on Tracheostomy Care as well as the uh, nursing protocols of Stanford uh, tracheostomy care and laryngectomy care. So I just wanted to ask, how many people have seen this before? Some people have seen this before. So this is a, uh, um, I mean this specific form. This specific form is actually on the Stanford um, internet uh, uh, accessible through the portal and is part of a document, a uh, nursing document on tracheostomy and laryngectomy care. Um, so this is kind of the idea of what we're looking at. It actually existed here before, although not in a form that I've ever seen used with training or with anyone else. So um, then my next move was to meet with nursing managers on C2, D2, G2S, and ICU, and this was to get uh, feedback, pre-project feedback on what they thought was important, whether they thought this was a good idea, how they would like to go about uh, uh, working with us on it, and then um, kind of drumming up support um, so that we would all be excited and uh, then uh, I designed, sort of cobbled together from existing uh, uh, models, a standardized airway form. Uh, I had that placed on uh, the trachea website, and then uh, we launched the project on April 8th. Uh, and basically the, the, the um, boundaries of the project as it exists right now are that the scope and head and neck teams, uh, for any patient that we are either primary on or consulting on, we are um, filling out one of these forms and putting it at the bedside. Um, that includes patients um, who we may not have performed a tracheostomy or laryngectomy on that visit, may not even be our tracheostomy or laryngectomy. Um, so the specifics of the implementation, um, the, this is all something that the residents are doing right now. It sort of keeps it simpler, keeps it in-house. I'm hoping to change that as I'll go into a little bit later. Um, but for any patient, uh, it says new surgical airway because those are the ones uh, that we're seeing most frequently. But it's really for anyone. Um, you print out and you fill the form, you fill out the form. Um, then uh, anytime the airway status changes, for instance, um, if you change the tracheostomy tube, um, if the patient previously was not tolerating passing air that was whiz and you know, there's a chance that they have better airway than the amount of nose, um, any pertinent information uh, is updated as, as, as uh, events occur. And then uh, the idea is that we place a text order for nursing um, to post the form at the bedside and to page the on-call if they notice that the patient has sort of the form is not um, I'm also working to get that order uh, added to our standard order sets and uh, to make it easier for us. So this is our surgical airway form. Um, I try to keep it as simple as possible in this first page because I know that there are things we want to change, things we want to add to it. Uh, again, the main differentiation is the tracheostomy versus laryngectomy. Um, up here, I've uh, pointed out the pertinent anatomy, and then there's an illustration of the pertinent anatomy right there. 
um, and then uh, saying that you may or may not be able to ventilate through the nose without an emergency. These are sort of the bare bones basics that we thought were the most important things to have there. Uh, down here, we note the current tube size, um, special instructions, um, and then this is all, also a place where you can put if there's any additional uh, equipment that should be at the bedside. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of room for us to add our own stuff, and we know that our patients are unique enough that this is, we need that kind of flexibility. So, we may decide eventually that this doesn't need to be changed very much at all, but you know, we can use that. So, in terms of evaluation, this is actually a very difficult project to evaluate because you have to figure out what you're, who are you trying to educate and what are your expectations for their education. Um, we do not expect uh, nursing staff to understand the intricacies of They can manage emergencies and manage those patients' care. Um, and uh, the, so, so I, we, are, we surveyed the nursing staff pre-implementation. We surveyed the uh, ENT residents pre-implementation. And I'm planning on surveying them again two months after this was started. Um, and essentially, the, the main things that I want to I wanted determine um, are levels of comfort with airway emergencies, uh, specifically for the nursing staff. Um, from the ENT perspective, whether we have confidence in uh, non-ENT teams uh, to correctly manage our patients in emergencies. And then also just some basic questions about um, uh, what you can and can't do with the tracheostomy. Um, really what I want to know is whether people think that this is a good idea. Because I think this, from the nursing staff perspective, that's really what's going to tell us that this is important. If they feel more comfortable with our patients, better understanding than you know, we're already winning about it. So what am I going to do in the future? Uh, the post-implementation surveys, those will be uh, circulated in June. Um, I want to review those for, to try to identify any specific knowledge deficits um, and give feedback on the project for the residents. Um, you really need to have ongoing feedback. Uh, we are going to be the most important part of this project because we are the ones who really will be able to determine whether or not it's helping. Um, we will also be uh, updating and modifying the form as we move forward. Um, and then what I hope to do at some point, in part because nursing specifically has requested this uh, every, time I bring it up, every time I bring this project up, is uh, to do some short end surfaces with the nursing and the ICU staff, um, with the airway form kind of as our, our centerpiece, um, but really to uh, instill some, some general uh, truths about surgical airways um, and things like things that they can have in their tool belts so they run to the bedside patient, maybe they, they don't know anything about the patient, but they know certain things based on what the surgery was. Um, and I think that's really kind of an ongoing process. We've done it in the past, um, and I think it's been long enough that uh, people are starting to ask for it again. Um, so uh, for acknowledgments, I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Sung and Damros for their uh, advice and their feedback on the project. I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Wo for his uh, really uh, communicating to us that there was um, a, a way to do this. Uh, Crystal Chen helped me with uh, getting the uh, form set up on, on trachea. Uh, the residents have been very uh, accommodating and giving feedback and also uh, putting all of the work into implementing the project so far. Like I said, I'm hoping to <coughs> set this up so that nursing prints out the form and get some of these little uh, bits of scout work off of our hands. Um, but for now, we're doing it ourselves. Um, and then finally, uh, I. I don't know of a way to do this uh, better, but I think UCSF deserves some credit for uh, having the idea, and I really just sort of stole from them essentially, but uh, I think it's a good idea. Um, and uh, I didn't speak with anyone directly at the school. Um, I think that uh, they deserve a little bit of credit. Um, so that's it. Uh, any questions, any thoughts on, you know, even at this early stage, on this new one? Have you talked to Peggy Wang? Uh, I do not uh, do because they're doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, there's a form from her today. This is through the, uh, just to make sure that yeah, there aren't two ships crossing at the night. Uh, we uh, met with uh, Dave Stan and I met with her the other day. Proposed, not knowing that you were doing this, uh, essentially the same form. Uh, sure. And then I probably would bring her to the loop, uh, and then maybe uh, in terms of popularizing these for different reasons, you have somebody, some an ICU fellow or that person's designee, uh, somebody from 
they're saying, and that person has a unique level of sophistication in the ICUs and is sometimes shockingly not present. Yeah, and I mean, I think a lot of that is. So that way, I think you'll get better buy in if they are part of the initial distribution of knowledge. Definitely. Being imposed by us. I think a lot of the knowledge level in the ICU is somehow you do have to come to our responsibility in terms of providing the education to be proactive in the construction of the system, which is why just the discussion. True, but an ICU fellow coming in from the NICU, trust me, hasn't a clue. Tries to innovate a patient who's had a laryngectomy. They need to get educated early on. I agree. And I think that in terms of, yeah, I mean, I've already crossed ships with nursing on this, obviously, because that forms a huge amount of my life. But I think that in part, this is sort of a pilot project. And that was why we put it together very quickly and implemented it very quickly. And part of that is to, we can think of this as kind of a stage one or stage two kind of trial where we're just kind of feeling things out. But from the, I forgot what the name of the committee is, but it's a very, very high level committee within the hospital that wants this done independently for a variety of different reasons. But talk to Pat Yell. I'll see if I can find the email from today and forward it to you. Yeah, there it is. Maybe we can do that another time. Yeah, no, that would be great. Thank you. It's the same one in color. OK. Do you know if the laryngectomy anatomy is discussed during ACLS or BLS training that most residents are supposed to be, I think? That's where you really are going to get the masses, because ABC, A is bleeding, and the laryngectomy anatomy should be covered there. Are the interns required to do BACLS or BLS? There you go. So hitting at that step, you're going to get a larger audience. And this is a national problem. It's not just here. Every center I've been part of during my training, you always hear about a case once in a while, somebody trying to innovate a laryngectomy patient by putting them out. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really good idea. I think this is a big problem, actually, is the transient nature of our resident group. And the fact that we were talking about the ICU staff, they change on a four-week basis. So even, I think it's challenging even to get a sense of whether any project being tried is going to get there. Well, I gave a talk to the palliative surgery fellows today. And one of the questions I asked the five fellows was to describe to me about the laryngectomy anatomy and how they would innovate. None of them knew about the, you know, you're supposed to innovate from the neck, which is astounding to me. It's really an education problem for, you know, if they're certified for ACLS, they should know what the anatomy is. One piece of just advice, make sure that your graphics are beautiful and they're easy to interpret visually. Your iconography is really important. And I think going back to what Liz was talking about in the design, you need to incorporate that into your form. I agree. I think it's better to do a different form for tracheostomy and laryngectomy so that no one is getting mixed up. Yeah, it's a very, for us, it's very easy to understand the picture because someone who's not doing that is very important. So the ones that are asking. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Thank